I would like to introduce Richard Fontana, my friend who I often don't agree with, but you should listen to everything he has to say very carefully because it's important. People think we agree on things, which is, which is bad for me, but um, well, thank you, Bradley. Uh, so this talk is about license compatibility. If Greg K.H. is still in the room, and I don't think he is, um, just whatever else I say, um, ZFS uh, under, under Cuddle is not compatible with GPLv2. Um, <laughs> even if I say anything in this talk, that seems to contradict that. And despite, despite the, the drafter of Cuddle is in this room as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this talk is about license compatibility. Um, that was actually one of the suggested topics for the CFP. And I didn't write the CFP. Tom did, so it's a legitimate topic, I suppose. Uh, so this is a really confusing topic, I think, and very fascinating because it's so confusing. But I, oh, and also, I should say, um, I I'm really jet lagged. I've had like uh, very little sleep, and my wallet was I lost my wallet yesterday. Bradley was with me at the time. Um, <laughs> So, but, but that sort of, For the know, record, none of us remember the number of the cab it was lost. Yes. None of us. All four you should people. always uh, try to remember the number of the cab and the cab company. And also, in anticipation, uh, Fontana is pre trolling Bikun. I think that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so, so this is a, a really confusing topic. Um, it's, it's, I mean, you can really only scratch the surface. Uh, so uh, I'm, uh, compatibility, sometimes people use the term compatibility in a broad sense, especially in the GPL context, to mean um, you know, proprietary versus GPL compatibility. Like, you know, basically, the rule is that, that that's an incompatible thing unless there's mere aggregation. That's the oldest use of the term license compatibility that I've ever found. That's not what people usually mean today when they talk about license compatibility. They talk about uh, they're sort of assuming they're in a pure floss world, and so they're talking about conflicts between floss licenses, uh, open source, free software licenses. Uh, I'm going to, I say I won't get into debates about, you know, scope of strong copyleft, even though that's very much relevant to the topic. Uh, and, you know, these are just, just my own thoughts on these things. So uh, I think the, it's a fascinating topic because the way people talk about it nowadays is, is just very odd, I think. The, so people talk about license compatibility. I mean, not a whole lot of people talk about it, but people, some people who, who you know, get into open source legal issues talk about license compatibility like it's something really important. And, and, then, and there's just a lot of confusion. This is one of the first things I noticed when I, um, um, I should explain, I, I, I'm a, a lawyer at Red Hat, so I've been at Red Hat for uh, six years, and I, I do you know, open source related legal work at Red Hat. And I, before working at Red Hat, I worked at um, SFLC with Bradley, uh, who no longer works at SFLC, like I, I, I no longer work there. And uh, I worked on the drafting of GPLv3 uh, when I was there for the FSF, which was our client. And this was the, the first issue that really pulled me into this area. I hadn't done much legal work in open source or free software before working at SLC. And this, this topic, I just not, I had not paid much attention to at all. And it really fascinated me how, because everyone was so confused about it. Uh, you know, I, I gave this talk at LinuxCon a, a year and a half ago about the boundary between free software and non-free software, <coughs> and how I, I complained about the fact that um, People just sort of don't, they look to these authority figures to give them the answers to, to things, like the FSF or the OSI. I guess I should mention I'm an OSI board member. But it's not really relevant to this topic. But, um, but I was critical of that at the time, and, and I still am. And I think I, I also see that in this, in this topic as well. That people, when people talk about license compatibility today, they say, you know, yeah, there's, there are all these rules. You've got to go see what the FSF has said. Or they might say, let's get a lawyer, and the lawyer will tell us the answer. Uh, as if the typical lawyer, you know, really understands this stuff. I mean, lawyers are just as confused as um, anyone else. And another thing is that when people talk about license compatibility, it's, it, it, there's this, what I, what I call this traps and pitfalls kind of rhetoric, which I see a lot in discussion of open source legal issues. It's kind of sort of like FUD, but it's sometimes even very well-meaning people uh, talk about open source legal issues in this way. They, they emphasize all of the problems that can come up, all of the, all of the mistakes you can make. And, uh, you know, there's this white paper I was looking at by um, Carl Fogel and James Wazeel, uh, our, our mutual former colleague, 
where they, they have a business where they um, advise like government agencies getting into open source. It's totally benign. They're, they're some of the greatest experts in the field. And this white paper uh, is uh, talks about you know the, the main uh, legal issues you should know about when dealing with open source. And they, they give a lot of emphasis to license compatibility. And they say that's one of the main issues that uh, organizations don't think about before open sourcing. And, it's a, and they talk about it in this kind of as if it's a, a great, you know, dangerous thing that, that, that if you don't start thinking about it early enough, it's gonna, it's gonna bite you later on. Uh, there, there, are, there are also now uh, companies that, that sell products that purport to identify, uh, you know, potential licensing compatibility situations in your, you know, it's typically proprietary code bases, but making use of open source. And I've seen some of these, uh, some of the output of these tools, and it's quite, quite interesting. And, and, and so, so there are companies making money off of this, uh, off of this concept, which, which uh, people are very confused about, which is maybe a, a bit odd. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't even, I can't answer this question, what is compatibility? Because uh, I think that, that all I can really talk about is what I think people are talking about when they talk about this topic. So everyone seems to agree that it has to, something to do with, um, you know, you're, you're, you're making software out of different components, uh, different files that are coming from different places, different copyright holders under different licenses, and there's concern that there might be some kind of conflict uh, between the licenses. Uh, everyone agrees that that's kind of what this is about. But I think that's about as coherent as it gets if there's any, any consensus about it. And, uh, you know, some people, Heather Meeker, Louis Villa, uh, well, the FSF also, have tried to um, come up with a generalized definition of what compatibility means. And I, I won't, you know, repeat it here because I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't, I find them unsatisfactory. Uh, so actually, so, so there is maybe something possibly relevant uh, in copyright law. So this is, may not be true of copyright law outside the U.S., but in the U.S. copyright statute, there's so so there you know the, all copyright regimes have a concept of um, derivative works or adaptations and, and compilations or collective works. Uh, we don't really know what where software, especially open source, free software, fits in in that. But it has some of the qualities of compilations, some of the qualities of derivative works. Uh, but the, the thing that compilations and derivative works have in common is that they have their works that are created out of pre-existing works or, or adapted from pre-existing works. And so you have multiple copyright <laughs> holders. And the, it's interesting that the U.S. copyright statute uh, goes out of its way to emphasize that um, if you have copyright in a compilation or copyright over a derivative work, that copyright doesn't extend to the pre-existing stuff. And that must be because people were confused about the concept uh, before the 1976 Copyright <coughs> Act, uh, which is the current one in, in force in the U.S., was enacted. So, so even in, in the traditional copyright system, this kind of parallel concept, I, I see it as a parallel concept, is, uh, was confusing some courts, presumably. Um, and I think this influenced the GPL. So, so there's like this you see phrase like collective work as a whole. That, that really reminds me of, of some phrases in the GPL, some key phrases. The GPL says you have to license the modified work as a whole under this license. I think there's, there's uh, an echo, a, d a deliberate echo of, of uh, some of the statutory language. So uh, when people talk about uh, compatibility, they, they, they're talking about, I, I think, two, two main things, and they're not necessarily distinct. So one is, um, you know, just is it the mere presence of code under different licenses a problematic thing? And then sort of the inquiry ends there. So if, if we're in the GPL universe, you know, maybe there's mere aggregation, and so that, that answers the question. There's no problem. Or otherwise, it probably is a problem. Uh, if we're talking about purely non-copyleft, simple, let's say simple non-copyleft permissive licenses, no one thinks there's a problem, right? Um, the, other, the other way people talk about this is they, they're kind of looking at it. Um, so this actually is a little bit like Heather Meeker's um, uh, formulation of what compatibility is all about. So maybe I've been somewhat influenced by that. So, so th the other way of looking at this is like it, a project has a has a license that it, it thinks of itself as um, presenting downstream, probably a single license. And the concern is if you take code that's from some other source under some other license, uh, is that going to have some kind of adverse effect on the license you want to present to your users? Is it going to 
And so some so, so some some developers talk about relicensing in this concept. And it's not it, it, it's not really they don't mean relicensing in the way that I would I would understand that term. I think what they what they mean is actually uh, that you know they want to have a simplified way of saying what the license is, and, and maybe inclusion of code under some other licenses makes it hard for them to say that 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 the license is this simple thing. So so for example, if you believe that the Apache license 2.0 is incompatible with GPLv2 only, a combination of uh, we'll assume it has copy left significance of you know mostly GPL2 only code with some Apache code is going to cause problems for people who care about this at all because they're going to think, oh, now I can't, you know, not, we can't just say um, the license is GPL. We actually have a, we have a legal problem here. And if it's an Apache project, um, and let's say it's GPL, GPL3, so Apache is considered compatible with GPLv3 uh, according to the FSF, right? Um, if it's an Apache project, you know, there's no incompatibility, but, but the but the Apache license project is not going to be able to say, or might be concerned that it can't say, that its license downstream is as simple as Apache license. It's really Apache license with this GPLv3 code, and there's some argument that you know the GPLv3 code causes the whole thing to be GPLv3. So that's you know this effect on 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 the downstream licensing is is another part of what people are talking about when they talk about compatibility. And I think I mean this has probably already confused you. It's 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 confusing, you know. It's not surprising because I don't think compatibility can really be understood um, as a general concept. It's 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 a mistake to try to generalize about it. Mo most so I mean, compatibility issues can come up in a non-GPL context, but usually they're they're not very serious, right? Because if you're just having if you're just simple permissive licenses, there really are no. It's assumed that there are no compatibility issues. Um, you know, maybe if you have some, you know, I don't know, uh, four clause BSD code in an Apache license source file, you might wonder what is the what is the license of that file, and is there some kind of conflict between the four clause BSD license and the Apache license? Some people might worry about that, but this is not usually an issue that comes up. But there's also weak copyleft licenses like MPL and EPL, but um, you know th those those licenses tend to be seen as as scoped by the source file. And so that tends not to be a problem as if we're outside of like you know mixing code inside single source files. So so it's basically a GPL problem, and that's not surprising because the the actual origin of this this idea of license compatibility came out of GPL two interpretation. It it wasn't like so this is this is a this is Athena springing from the head of Zeus. So license compatibility did not spring from the head of Richard Stallman. It it came out of uh, years of um, debate in the free software community during the 1990s. Uh, and uh, I think some of that debate sort of changed w once Bradley came on the scene. But, you know, that's my first effort to troll you. Uh, so I'm not going to read all this. I didn't, I uh, so so this, is, this is the language that developers in the 1990s were looking at. They were trying to understand the GPL. They were trying to understand, they realized that they were mixing GPL code, which was, that they, these were GPL using developers. And they realized that there was a lot of GPL code with code under other licenses, like the four clause BSD license, which had that advertising credit requirement, right? And they were they they read the GPL and they wondered, isn't there some problem here? Because they saw that there was this provision that says you can impose further restrictions. And they knew about strong copyleft, and they knew that strong copyleft had something to do with this clause, which says that you know you must cause any work that you distribute that in whole or in part contains or is derived from a very broad language. Uh, it must be licensed as a whole uh, under the terms of this license. They, you know, the, what did that mean if you were taking code that was under another license? Uh, they were trying to figure that out, and uh, and also there's this this very odd section in GPLv2 that talks about identifiable identifiable sections that are that are independent and separate uh, that become part of the GPLv2 work when you're modifying it. I think what this was intended to refer to. This was probably drafted by Jerry Cohen, who was the lawyer who worked with Richard Stallman in, in 1991 when, when GPLv2 was drafted. Uh, I think what this is about is like, you know, someone might want to modify a GPLv2 program, but, but they using some proprietary stuff that they had copyright over. And they, in a different context, they might want to license it under a proprietary license. But in the GPL context, it had to be, you know, under the terms of this license. 
So I think that's what this is about. But, but developers reading this in the mid 1990s, late 1990s, thought, okay, this this applies in some way to license compatibility. This has, this is this sheds some light on the issue of license compatibility. Um, so by the year 2000 or so, this doctrine was actually pretty well formed, and as I said, the result of a lot of thinking and debate by many people. It wasn't just Richard Stallman. It was Richard Stallman, Alan Cox, the famous Linux kernel developer, was very active in talking about this issue. Um, many people in the Debian community had an influence on this. There were some very significant cases, not court cases, but cases uh, that were dealt with in the community. Uh, the BSD issue, so the BSD uh, license, there, there was a lot of mixing of BSD code with GPL code. And the BSD license at the time had this advertising credit requirement, and it had an anti-publicity clause. And developers said, "Well, isn't this isn't this a further restriction? Isn't this um, conflicting with the GPL?" Uh, the um, introduction of the Mozilla public license and N Netscape public license at the same time in 1998 was a big deal, and uh, because uh, originally Mozilla uh, Netscape rather had said that it would use the GPL, and it decided not to do so. Uh, and the biggest uh, uh, most controversial issue, uh, which I had forgotten about, but I, I'm sure Bradley at least remembers, was the controversy over KDE and Q. Yeah, that, that was the probably the most influential um, license compatibility crisis of all time, and that involved at a certain phase of it, not the most. Okay. Uh, no, I agree with you. I'm, I'm remembering with pain. Uh, yeah, it was a terrible. <laughs> so, so basically, I think what, from our, so originally it was a it was not a, a license compatibility problem. It was a proprietary versus GPL problem, and then um, Trolltech put Qt under this new license called the QPL. But um, it was general. I mean, p people generally said, you know, this this is this is inconsistent with the GPL for multiple reasons, and you know, for two years Debian kept uh, or maybe more uh, KDE out of uh, out of Debian. Because of the because of the issue of license compatibility, so it was a really serious thing. I think the KDE project at the time was seen as this very dangerous, lawless project that was just taking other people's GPL code and uh, you know linking it against uh, first a proprietary library, then a, a GPL incompatible library. Uh, so this had a big effect on uh, you know shaping people's understandings of, of what this was all about, and and certain principles came out of this. So. So one thing is that you know you can't read the GPL so literally. So GPL says you know you must license the entire modified work under this license. Well, that doesn't mean that there can't be parts that are under different licenses, right? So uh, uh, you know another idea that came out of this, which is not consistent with with everything that happened, is that you know maybe com what makes a license compatible is if it grants a superset of the permissions that are granted by the GPL. So that was a basic principle that. That, that many people tried to articulate. Uh, w maybe coupled with this other view that, that if some, some provision in a license is essentially like a provision in the GPL, there was no problem with it. So GPL says you're supposed to put in, you're certainly supposed to preserve license notices and copyright notices. If another license says that in roughly the same way, that's not going to be considered an additional restriction. right? Um, and the other, other thing is, um, that, that there seemed to be, this wasn't really articulated well, but, but the idea of burdensomeness was key. So some restrictions, like the advertising requirement, Richard Stallman very eloquently uh, argued for, you know, why this was bad as a policy matter. He didn't actually talk about the compatibility issue in this famous essay he wrote, but, um, but he talked about how bad, bad it was from a policy level that, that the BSD license had this advertising clause in it. Uh, so, I, and I think what he was getting at was that it was just, you know, in practice, a if you try to comply with a clause like that, it's just going to be too burdensome. Uh, whereas this other clause in the BSD license, which has no counterpart in the GPL, this anti-publicity clause, which today is in the three clause BSD license, and many people think it has something to do with, like, um, advertising. So they ask me, isn't this the, the, the advertising clause? And so there's, there's, there's confusion about that. But I think the, the view at the time was uh, uh, an anti-publicity clause is, you know, that's probably you know, just kind of restates what background law would require um, under some theory. And so it's not it's not in the GPL, but but it's not such a big deal. It's not so burdensome to have an anti publicity clause. Um, so then we enter this this later period and this is where, you know, Bradley comes in and and uh, I think this is very so you know from two thousand to two thousand six, two thousand seven what I, my sense is that people stopped 
having these debates out of about license compatibility to the same extent, and the FSF really took a leadership over development of this this sort of doctrine. And I think this is um, uh, I would say that 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 license compatibility became less coherent during this period, maybe because there wasn't as much debate as there was earlier on. That's my read of the history. Uh, so. You know, this culminated in GPLv3. So GPLv3 has, um, you know, GPLv3 was uh, tried to do some really interesting things around the issue of license compatibility. It tried to codify the FSF doctrine on what what kinds of terms were compatible with the GPL. It tried to relax some of the some of the traditional doctrine to some degree, and it tried to unify um, license compatibility of doctrine with a couple of other doctrines that the FSF had talked about, such as granting additional uh, permissive exceptions, and also uh, the FSF's criticism of the practice of tacking on restrictions to the GPL. So the FSF had the idea of unifying that whole body of theory in one section of, of GPLv3, which is section 7 of, of the current license. And, um, you know, and it's just sort of interesting that, that, that they did that. Uh, so in GPLv3, you see these categories of um, terms that are traditionally considered um, compatible. And, and just to show you the an example of the confusion that I think existed at the time, there was the famous case, I think, of the X-Free86 uh, 1.1 license, which was considered incompatible because it had this attribution, you had to provide attribution notice in documentation. But there was another license, the EU data grid license, that had the same provision, and the FSF said that that was compatible. Uh, and you know, maybe there, maybe I'm missing something. I, I, you know, I, I, there could be some distinguish, some way to distinguish too. But I think there's an inconsistency there, and I think that that confusion actually has persisted after GPLv3 because of the because of the fact that this was. So I I, I was drafting this part of GPLv3, and I, I made sure that this was included. That attribution was included in this in this category description, and and I think it's caused some confusion uh, afterwards because of this this legacy of. Um, you know, treating these two licenses differently for compatibility purposes, even when I think the only thing that that makes them incompatible with the GPL is is this attribution requirement. Or you know, the only thing that makes this one incompatible is an attribution requirement that's very similar to the one in this license, which is also an attribution requirement. So I think it's. It, I guess my main point is, that it, you know, the FSF. You know, they're they're, they're not perfect. So so so, you know, it's easy to see how how. There could be some inconsistency in the, the developing doctrine, right? Uh, yeah. So, oh, the, the most interesting case, which was before GPLv3, was the Apache license 2.0, which was released in 2004. And in 2005, the FSF said, you know, this is not compatible with GPLv2. And I, I, I still don't, I don't understand the reasoning. The, the reasoning has something to do with the patent termination clauses. So, in the Apache license, you're you grant a patent license if you're the licensor, and under certain circumstances, uh, that patent license can be terminated. Now, it, I see this isn't you know isn't a grant of a patent license an additional permission from the perspective perspective of GPLv2? And so, if you're taking back an additional permission, why is that causing compatibility? So I don't know, I don't I don't understand this, and I think it's inconsistent with what the FSF has said about certain other licenses, both before and after this time. So the clear BSD license and CC0 both basically say, you know, we are not granting you a patent license. So those are considered compatible with the GPL. This was considered incompatible with the GPL. Now in GPLv3, I discovered this other way, other other uh, justification for incompatibility, this upstream indemnification clause. And so in the end, this is what how the issue was resolved. The, uh, the FSF added this provision to Section 7 of GPLv3 that says that you can, that it's not an additional you know, it's not a violation of, of the GPL or an additional restriction to add an, up, an upstream indemnification, indemnification clause like the Apache license. So, so again, this kind of inconsistency characterizes this period. Um, GPLv3 also created these new incompatibility problems. Uh, so, so one was the um, this 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 you know realization that LGPLv3, the new version of the LGPL, which is uh, basically GPLv3 with some additional permissions was going to be incompatible with GPLv2 only, which was totally uh, totally consistent with what the FSF has said about um, how copyleft clauses like the ones in the MPL 
clash with those of the GPL. So, so it's it very, very logically consistent with what the FSF had said before. But nonetheless, this, this, this angered a lot of people at the time, and I know Bradley remembers this, because it, it, it went against their intuition about, about what the LGPL was supposed to mean in a kind of abstract sense. And I think also there were corporate interests who were concerned about this. So, so for the most part, so Bradley and I have often talked about how there were, you know, well, there was a lot of corporate lobbying in the drafting of GPLv3, but the corporations were mostly, they didn't care about license compatibility at all. This was the one issue that they started to kind of, this caused them to wake up, because I think they were worried about glibc becoming an LGPLv3 uh, project, which didn't quite happen. Um, other issue, closely related, is, um, uh, you know, it was realized that GPLv2 only code, uh, as opposed to GPLv2 or later code, would be incompatible with GPLv3, and this, and some people thought that this was going to be a big problem. Uh, uh, and and, and that, yeah, that fits in with the FSF's theory. So, so GPLv2 or later is interpreted, or by this time was interpreted by the FSF as meaning GPLv2, but you have additional permission to use to treat GPLv3 as a license. So that's why GPLv2 or later is considered compatible with GPLv3, and why GPLv2 only is considered invalid because they have clashing provisions, including clashing copyleft provisions. But what, what I think what the FSF had uh, originally um, imagined would happen was that, that this might encourage projects to migrate from GPLv2 or later to GPLv3. And that isn't what happened. What, what happened was people treated this as a logical rule that if you have some GPLv2 or later code and some GPLv3 code, there's no compatibility problem. And so today, we see a lot of code that you know, kind of mixed together, where some is GPLv2 or later, some is GPLv3, and it's, there's no ac explicit act of like changing the license of the GPLv2 or later code. So it's 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 just a kind of you know, exercise of a, a it's a logical exercise, as I say. It's not it, it, the, the user doesn't see uh, the whole thing is under GPL. They see part of it is under GPL v3, part of it is under GPLv2 or later. Uh, so. <laughs> Check on my time here. Yeah, so there's there's part of um, this is a fame if for those of you. Who, well, I, I don't know if, if Trix is marketed outside of the U.S. This is a famous children's uh, serial in the U.S. Uh, uh, associated with an anthropomorphic rabbit, uh, uh, somewhat modeled on on Sisyphus uh, in Greek mythology. So so uh, a a a key part of license compatibility doctrine that people don't really talk about explicitly is what well I, I, you know maybe this is the wrong word but i think of it as as a as a as a kind of uh a, as a body of tricks that that you can use so there are ways of getting around license compatibility that are well known to at least some of us um of course you can always try to argue that that you're outside of copyleft scope so you just have mere aggregation so the gpl does not affect um is not affected by any you know supposedly incompatible license that's outside of gpl scope uh, oh, something that, that everyone tries to do is argue that the um, the incompatible license is a system is is covered by the system library exception. There's this thing in the GPL called the system library exception, and um, in the KDE crisis, people tried to argue that well, why can't Debian just make Qt a system library? Make put, you know distribute Qt uh, even when it was proprietary. People people propose this, right? So so this is really fascinating. So so. So it's like everyone tr tries to resort to the system library exception, right? Um, my colleague Spot, who's probably not in the room, hopefully, uh, he, he has said that you know for the Fedora project, it is official doctrine that OpenSSL, which has an advertising clause like the old BSD license, is for is a system library or covered by the system library exception for purposes of uh, Fedora. Uh, now he he you know he and I had arguments about this, and I said you know what. You go ahead. You go ahead and, and, and say this, and you know I don't object to it. And let's Last see what. Last ten words. You know what it means. Oh, unless the, um, it accompanies distribution of the executable. Oh yeah, no, no. Oh, I thought you were talking about something in the open SSL license, which is. No, I'm talking about the. No, no. So, so, so no, it's, it's totally. Yeah, I agree. It's totally bogus. I mean, I, I, I hate to say, I, but but see, I think I think the result is is not. Uh, maybe this will become clearer. Maybe not at the end of the talk. But I think the result may not be incorrect. But I think the reasoning is obviously bogus. I mean, you know, it's how is open SSL a system co covered by the system library exception? Is, yeah, oh, yeah right, exactly. That's the exception with me, within the, the exception. exception. The exception. And even the, the one in GPLv3 is so complex, no one really understands what it means. So you have to kind of read the GPLv2 version to understand what it means. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I've got to be honest. So, 
so um, oh, so uh, you can always, um, you know, uh, maybe this is this is uh, maybe I shouldn't call this a trick. You you can get try to get the GPL copyright holders to grant an additional permission, a linking exception, as the FSF calls it, or you can infer it by conduct. And I have done this tons of times to try. When I used to when I used to like take this stuff a little bit more seriously, I would I would look at a. a <laughs> There are GP I remember when I first started at Red Hat, I had breakfast with Bradley, and I said, Bradley, there's GPL code bases that have non-Berkeley. You see, Berkeley had revoked the advertising clause. But there's tons of code that's copyrighted by uh, uh, universities, other, basically universities, uh, sometimes individuals, other than Berkeley. And it has the advertising clause in it. And so you can't just say, oh, that doesn't exist anymore. And I said, Bradley, do you realize that there's all this GPL code that contains Advertising clause, BSD like lies. I hadn't. I was so innocent. I didn't notice. And so I. But then I saw. Okay, I can come up with a trick. I can. I can. I can try the infer additional permission trick. I learned that from from my mentor Scott Peterson, and uh, and RMS himself uh, had endorsed this kind of analysis. And the problem is, it's really difficult to do that if you have a lot of copyright holders, right? Uh, how can you infer additional permission if you have if you don't know who all the copyright holders are? Uh, you can always try to get the, the uh, non-GPL copyright holders to change their license or grant additional permission. That, that actually works, you know, sometimes. Oh, that was good Bradley said. So, so uh, uh, oh, I've done, the, I've done this tons of times. Find, you know, find an early, so, so after GPL v3 came out, a lot of companies, um, <laughs> HP uh, was one of them, um, a lot of, like, like IBM, I think. Uh, so, so a lot of companies like th they used to license their code under GPL two or later, and then they they someone someone you know in these companies some lawyer said wait we got to get rid of the or later because you know they, they didn't like GPL three so you know that's fine but but um, you know you can always go back to the previous version and, and uh, of a source file that you want to use and you can find you know it's licensed GPL two or later uh, and this is this is very convenient um, you know people, very very good trick uh, now I, t I said to Bradley once is this is this okay and Bradley said you know didn't you say it's kind of unethical to do this um, in some circumstances I think I said it I was, was talking about a community product so so yeah, I think I think it was um, I think I said it was mean <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on the context you know technical issues around that. I mean, I'm not even a technical person, I'm saying. Well, like, I can so just hear, like, the developers going, no, I don't want to use an old version, it's going to be outdated. And but see, often they're not outdated, that's the thing. <laughs> often they're, they don't change at all. And, and so they can be easily adapted, so you can make changes that are really of no copyright significance. It's a really good trick. Now, uh, <laughs> the low point, the low point in the history of, of linking exceptions is this exception that you probably can't read, but Bradley and I worked on it together after GPL3. Bradley wanted to put STET, which was the um, AJAX commenting system that G the GPLE3 text had used, under, he wanted it to be the first, um, first software ever under the new version of the AGPL, because Bradley loved the AGPL. And uh, so we worked on this, this exception together because AG at that point, STET was closely integrated with RT on the back end. RT was under GPLV2 only, so that's like incompatible, right? <coughs> so. So Bradley and I worked on this exception, and, and it says, you know, you have whatever additional permissions you need to use this with, with RT. By the way, RT is under GPLv2. It doesn't mention, you know, why there might be a problem. And maybe that m what our thinking was is we didn't even know if there was a problem. So maybe, you know, I, I think you still like this. I think it's I think in the top ten list of your most brilliant inventions. Actually. I I, <laughs> I now I now you know I I'm embarrassed by this now. It's it's, like, it's it's beautiful but embarrassing. Oh, so so many licenses try to deal with this question. Oh, this is what. So Alison Randall might still be in the room. Uh, there's a photo of Alison Randall, and she said it was okay for there to be a photo. So it's, it's okay that I guess that she's in the room and there's a, there's a photo. Uh, so, so some licenses have these relicensing clauses that are that are specifically designed to avoid compatibility problems with GPL. Uh, so, earliest example. So, I don't even want to talk about LGPL because LGPL is so confusing. Uh, but LGPL, the original version, had this clause that said, you know, if if you want, you can alter all the license notices in LGPL code and change it to GPL. You can even use it with with future versions of the GPL. And you might want to do this because it might be useful if you want to copy the code into, into software that's not a library. Because originally LGPL was designed for libraries that proprietary software would link against. 
And this ended up being used, you know, by the late 90s. People saw this as a justification for why LGPL was GPL compatible. I don't think that was what uh, whoever draft. I don't know if Richard Stallman drafted that, but I, I don't think that was the original purpose. But that t that became the justification. Uh, there's there's a when I was working on the drafting of GPLv3, I put this sentence in section seven, which I talked about, which was about relicensing clauses. I said, you know, you, you the purpose of this was you can't take relicensing clauses so seriously because you know. Just because you say you can relicense under the GPL doesn't mean the incompatible thing doesn't flow down to the licensee. So you might still have incompatibility. This was like you know my brilliant insight at the time, and I and I, I really struggled to keep this in GPLv3, but it's been totally ignored. Uh, so oh, there's Allison. So so um, artistic 2.0 has a relicensing clause in it that's sort of oriented towards the GPL. And um, the problem is, so, so the artistic license has an Apache style patent license grant with patent termination. And the question is, does the relicensing clause, um, you know, is there, is there some problem here? Because, because if the Apache license is incompatible with GPLv2, shouldn't the artistic license also be incompatible with GPLv2 despite the relicensing clause? Or is the relicensing clause enough to uh, take care of the problem? So. Well, I, c I came up with, with this justification that, um, you know, based on that clause, I should be, that, that, that the relicensing clause extinguished all of the incompatible stuff from the earlier license. I didn't, ex uh, so, and, I, and I wrote this in a, in a, or ghost wrote it in a document accompanying one of the drafts of GPLv3 in 2007. Uh, I didn't explain why I thought that, that the uh, patent termination in artistic was extinguished. The reason I thought it was was because I noticed that in the relicensing clause, uh, there was no requirement to preserve the Apache, the uh, artistic license, the text of the license. So I thought, well, so you know, anyone getting the code under that's relicensed isn't going to even know about the fact that some of it started out as artistic. So, so I thought that that, that made sense. Um, actually, so and and I remember talking to Allison in I think it was 2011 in Vancouver in the airport, where I asked her. You know, do you know that that this was this all whole thing was based on the fact that there was no required to preserve the uh, the license text? And she said, "Oh yeah, that was intentional." So I feel I felt much better about it. After. The extra history, um, yes. Oh yes. So, in other words, we can blame everything on Bradley. So, <laughs> okay. So, so the case. So, um, you know, a couple of other. Li so, these are some European licenses. Uh, Cec Cecil Cecil, um, you know, has a very simple uh, couple of clauses that say, you know, basically you can relicense under the GPO. Um, it's there's a well, some of that's unidiomatic, but that's okay. So. Um, there's a better, I think, better drafted provision in another European license, the EUPL. Uh, that's uh, Patrice uh, Emmanuel Schmitz, uh, I believe. And uh, and this clause says it, it it actually gets to this issue. So it says, if uh, this is something you commonly see in, in commercial contracts, if the obligations under the uh, say the GPL conflict with obligations under EP, EUPL, the GPL prevails. So that takes care of the issue, right? So that's that's a that's a well drafted. Kind of relicensing clause. Now, really aggravating to me, the FSF said that you know. So okay, so EPL lists a set of licenses that are compatible with it in the sense that you can relicense EUPL code or derivatives of it um, to those other licenses. And GPLv2 is on the list. They excluded GPLv3 intentionally from the list at the time. Uh, uh, there's a draft now of a ver new version that adds GPLv3. So, by that time, GPLv3 was excluded. The FSF came up with a theory for why you can get around this. First, you you, you take some Cecil code, then you know you use that relicensing, then then you you know you you uh, take EUPL code, and you so you do two you make you take advantage of two different re, uh, relicensing clauses at different points in time, and you end up with GPLv3. And and this is this is very clever, and I, I admire it. But there's also you know the EUPL drafters didn't clearly did not want this to happen. And yes, I am sympathetic to the FSF on this point because for various reasons, but still there's something that bothers me about that. So oh, yes. Well, I've been invented that. That's, that's how been Evan, Evan came up with this? 
No, the thing before. Oh, 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 yeah. really? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so the, <laughs> this is Lewis Via, he, he dr pr primary drafter of, of MPL 2.0. So yeah, I, I, I won't go into this, but, but he came up with a, a clever solution to the problem of MPL uh, compatibility with GPL. Uh, and uh, basically, it's you know you can you can dual license um, a so MPL MPL is file scoped, and you can uh, uh, it always said that you could include MPL code in larger works under other licenses, but there was this problem of GPL incompatibility. So so in, in this clause, uh, MPL says you can you can take an MPL file, um, distribute it under both MPL and say GPL, and um, then the person receiving it has the choice of treating it as GPL or MPL or just you know passing that downstream, and the larger work may be under GPL, and that takes care of the incompatibility. And this is you know I ca I can't criticize this, but every every time I think about this, I have to go back and see that it works because. It's almost, you know, it's it's almost Larry Wall like in a way. It, it's it's uh, it's too clever for its own good. So, um, oh, uh, well, you know, I, I'm famous for my Apache GPL two or later compatibility theory. So, some people seem to think that the Apache license is incompatible with GPL v two because the FSF said so, and they think that has to apply to GPL v two or later. But of course it doesn't, because GPL v two or later means you can follow the terms of GPL v three. Apache license means the Apache license. This means if I'm distributing this combination, I'm imposing no further restrictions. And therefore, this, is, this cannot be considered incompatibility. It doesn't matter that no one's you know, downstream is getting GPLv3. It's just this persistent potential GPLv3 licensing of all. So there's never any incompatibility. Um, and actually, Chris, triplesec, uh, Anasek, it turns out that he, he came up with the same theory. So it has to be right. So. Um, yeah, so, so this is, I, I don't know how many people know about this theory of mine, but I have, you know, it's unassailable. And it's completely consistent with the view that GPLv2 or later and GPLv3 are compatible without actually having to doing, doing some kind of explicit conversion of licenses. So, um, yeah, there's, th I think there's, there's something wrong with this. So, so this is all, this is like, this is all kind of ridiculous on some level. You know, it's, we have this complex doctrine that's not poorly understood, and then we have these um, well-known ways of circumventing, which is kind of a, a you know a, a waste of, of intellectual energy. It creates these these business opportunities for you know lawyers. You know that's not that's not a great thing. Uh, consulting <laughs> companies, uh, these com these these pro uh, proprietary compliance tool vendors, they're all benefiting from this complexity. Uh, you know, I mentioned that the tricks. I, some of them require unconcentrated copyright control, which some of us think is controversial. Uh, so there have been some cases, some known historical cases, where, where a, a GPL incompatible license was chosen specifically to prevent sharing with GPL. Kind of a, um, you know, an example was there was a BSD project that used the advertising clause after the, the FSF and everyone else in the GPL community had concluded that the advertising clause was GPL incompatible because they didn't want GPL projects to use the code. The original view was that you know, they didn't care about the issue. Uh, so that, you know, that's not good. Uh, so uh, this guy from Kitware um, recently wrote this article where he says, you know, I used to like the GPL, but you know, it's just GPL is too complex. I like permissive licenses now, and um, and you know, he, he goes into detail about you know, it's the compatibility issues that that made him think that GPL is so complex, right? Um, he says, uh, uh, you know, I've never seen a, a license compatibility chart for permissive licenses. So so this is kind of bad. If this is why people are are. I mean, Bradley was talking about. The, the issue of, you know, copy, what is the future of copyleft? If this is the reason why people are not using GPL, there's something, something's very, very wrong here. You know, license That's incompatible. Oh, perhaps, perhaps. Um, uh, so, so these tricks, um, you know, I mean, I've already alluded to this, and this is also an opportunity to make fun of, like, my impression of Java class names. So, so <laughs> the, I have seen things like this. So start out with LGPL2. Or, or later code, add some Apache code. Before 2007, this had to be incompatible. This is a single source file, because it's like GPL analysis. After GPL v3, though, you can say, ah, this, this can be re-licensed to GPL v2, v2, GPL v3 or LGPL v3. So the license in theory, on some level that no one ever sees, is GPL v3, and therefore, it's compatible. In this case, LGPL v2 only, the only difference is you can't um, go to LGPLv3, so you have to go to GPLv3. 
So um, this is compatible because in some theoretical sense that no one cares about or knows about, it's GPL. It, this is you know kind of a ridiculous doctrine. So ah. is it safe to trust developers to, in their de declaration of packages, to note that it, the derivative work is, or the combined work is actually GPL v3? No one does this. That's the point. No. And a more fundamental issue, Tom, is that no one ever talks about like what's going to happen. Like, like, so James Bazile and Carl Fogel said, it's, oh, it's, uh, this is such an important problem that no one pays attention to. <laughs> what actually happens when you have licensing compatibility? Bradley's not going to sue you, right? You're going to sue someone for, an, for like a, linking Apache code with um, GPLD2 only code? Depends on the details. <sighs> <laughs> really, no, He's not no. even a lawyer. He knows how to answer that. You, 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 <laughs> the, the answer to this question is there. There, I won't say there are no consequences because the KDE case shows that there could be serious consequences. But I almost think that that was a one-off, as serious as it was. And I don't know if that would happen today. And this is a disturbing statement I'm making here. I realize, but uh, I, I don't. I don't. Th there are no consequences because. Because, Bradley, yeah. because, Bradley, in the real world, notice two things. First of all, no one observes these rules anyway. No one pays attention to them for the most part. Second of all, we do. when... We do. We do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> and we were the people who caused the problem, caused the problem all those years ago. I'm talking about the upstream for the projects record, that you... For that's Ian Jackson from Debian. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, hi. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, so um, I not realize... I, I would say that, for the most part, um, Debian is, is exceptional in this case, and I'm not sure we can even generalize about the entire Debian community on this point. Uh, so, so you know, no one, no one cares about this. Okay, not no one. Like, but, but, uh, there's so much, uh, you know, and I, this is this is a slippery slope here. So, I, like, yeah, you know, the there are laws against murder, right? And <laughs> that doesn't mean that no one murders anyone. But this is like everyone is murdering everyone pretty much. 98% of people are murdering everyone, and there are laws against murder, right? It's a, the other no, thing no, is. No, no, it's, it's assault with a, le with a, with a or it's a lesser included felony issue. It's, it's murder with assault included. That's we have to worry about murder with assault included, lesser included felonies. When has, every, when has anybody ever, like, enforced on these things? So, so like, who's ever enforced, you know, like, uh, I don't know. The advertising clause, you know, when is that even going to come up? I mean, these these things are just yesterday. I, well, I think to me that what I find frustrating about it is, and and I think your talk follows this like exact uh, continuum, is that you go down this sort of you know rabbit hole of this yes, compatibility issue, that. and the bigger question is, was there derivative work to begin with? Right, which is which is already a hard enough question to answer in some cases, and because if there wasn't, you don't need to go down this this rabbit hole. And I think and I think that's actually a, a thing a lot of people miss. I mean, I'd, I'd hear people who knew very little in a previous job about about licensing, but and and they'd be like, but they're you know they're really trying to do the right thing, and they're like, what about this licensing? I mean, I heard people who knew you know very little, what about this licensing compatibility thing? You, to, you know, and I had to sort of stop and go, well. First, you should ask if there's a derivative work, because if there isn't, then you know it's part two of the question. And so right, that, that's, I guess uh, that's that that in way the other side. More energy should be spent at that first question. Yeah, yeah. So, there, so in a sense, this is different from the from the point I was just making. It's like the other side of it, which is that some people, I, I think a minority of people, actually do think about this question, but they sort of overthink it. You know, they don't they don't get to the, the fundamental question that they should be answering first, which is whether uh, something comes in under GPLs copyleft scope or not. So, so what's the argument in favor of this ridiculous system? So, so you might think it uh, has to be correct, so how can anyone criticize it? You know, maybe that's, I don't know whose view that might be. The, the one that I came up with that, you know, maybe it makes some sense. Maybe Bradley might agree with this. I told you this. Oh, so I stole it from you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> may, maybe somehow this, this sort of lesser copyleft doctrine of license incompatibility strengthens the much more serious issue of um, you know, combinations of GPL works and proprietary works, right? Uh, which is the which is lesser included felony. That's my point. Yeah, um, I think there's th this. If there is an argument, this is the strongest one. I, I, I think, you know, but you might ask yourself, Bradley, uh, is is there no better way? <laughs> is there no better way, Bradley? And um, you know, I think Martin Mikos. Uh, 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 <laughs> may have, may have, 
you know, come up with a, an interesting solution here. So actually it wasn't Martin Lucas, it was Zach Grant. And so Zach Grant was, was concerned about, um, I'm reconstructing this a little bit, but I think he was concerned. He, so Zach Grant was the first community manager, I think, in the history of open source. Is that correct? Yeah. He used that title. Uh, so he, he, was, he, he knew that MySQL was getting a bad reputation in, in free software and open source communities for its overreaching interpretations of the GPL. I worked for MySQL. We deserve that bad reputation. Okay. So, so <laughs> and, and if, if I'm getting the history wrong, correct me. Um, oh, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know if you know about this, Eileen, but, but I verified that Sun changed the name from Floss to Floss. I, I don't know if there's any significance to that. But anyway, so... so um, Zach came up with this I idea, why don't we have like a special exception to deal with compatibility problems for, for you know, well-meaning, pure, open source type people, you know, floss people. And so there is this uh, floss exception, I've paraphrased it here, I won't go into details, it's kind of convoluted, but it, the idea is um, you can, they take the, this, that independent and separate identifiable sections language from GPLv2, and they say you can take our GPL client libraries and combine it with, or you know, whatever they mean by combine, um, uh, these in independent and separate works that are under certain authorized floss licenses. And as long as you obey the GPL and you provide complete, complete and corresponding source code for the non-GPL one. And I think there is something interesting and useful about this concept. And it's not so different from what the FSF recommends for uh, a linking exception for the floss case. So the FSF, for, for example, in GNU uh, WGET, the, ex the linking exception is you can link against open SSL libraries, but you have to provide the complete, your, when you provide complete source code, so see in a sense linking exceptions cut off copyleft at the point of the boundary with, with the incompatible library. But then this exception says that um, you have to provide your source code for the GPL part has to include the source code for the incompatible license part. Somewhat like the, the MySQL approach. And it also reminds me of the, the uh, GPLv3, AGPLv3 cross compatibility provisions, the, which, in, you know, because ordinarily GPLv3 and AGPLv3, AGPLv3 would have um, clashing copyleft provisions. Uh, and um, this was a workaround or a fix was made to this in, in both of those licenses. They have these parallel provisions. And they basically say you can, you can combine GPLv3 stuff with AGPLv3 stuff. They, they stay under their own license. So I, I, I see this as a weakening of their copyleft, but you have to. But the AGPL uh, special requirements, which, which are triggered by you know uh, uh, interactive deployment over a, a network, apply to the GPL part as well as to the AGPL part. So again, again, this variation on this theme I've been talking about, where you solve the, the compatibility problem, uh, but you the source code requirement extends to the combination. So so you have to provide the same amount of source code that you would apply if they weren't incompatible. Right? And so... Uh, uh, Richard, you're basically out of time, so you need to wrap oh, up. Oh, yeah. That's right. Uh, okay, so, so my only suggestion for a solution to this is, um, you know, basically follow those examples. So, so you, you, could, you could say that um, uh, a whole range of previously, you know, licenses considered incompatible are compatible if you treat them as though, you know, they were GPL, so that you, you provide the same source code that you would provide if they were compatible, if, if, if there were no compatibility issue. Uh, and this, this moves the doctrine closer to the, you know, kind of de facto community behavior, because it isn't really characterized by adherence to those um, formal rules about compatibility. Uh, and you could make some objections to this, uh, you know, maybe this undermines strong copyleft, but I think you're, you're getting this with the four freedoms. Um, if things are proprietized, then you could say that traditional doctrine kicks in again. Uh, if you object that, I, that how can you speak of this idea of, of changing license compatibility doctrine, it doesn't, it, license compatibility doctrine was developed by people, and uh, it can be changed by people. And there is something ugly about this idea, if you, I'll, I'll publish the slides and you'll see that it's sort of ugly, so it reminds me of the Sleepy Cat license, but uh, I think it's an interesting idea, but I haven't really fleshed it out yet. So that's all I got.